You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 1st, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, regional immunity. Our presenter is Dr. Christina Chacho. She's in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. All right, so today we're talking about Chapter 13, which is a regional immunity, and there's actually almost nothing new introduced, but it just kind of tries to put together um, the different components that we learned at uh, some different sites. It's actually, well, it should be pretty quick. Um, we'll see. Okay. Um, so the regional immune system is a collection of components of the immune system that serve specialized functions at a particular anatomic location, in particular, um, we're going to talk about the GI tract, the respiratory tract, um, cutaneous immune system, and genitourinary so is another example that doesn't get covered heavily in this chapter. Um, in general, it consists of an outer epithelial bar uh, barrier and then connective tissue in draining lymph nodes. Um, a lot of the role of the regional immune system counter to what we've learned is actually to suppress immune responses um, because they have such an intense burden of non-pathogenic um, organisms at any given moment and other harmless foreign substances. Uh, but, of course, this is uh, a primary place where the immune response is mounted uh, to pathogenic organisms. So the GI tract, of course, is a tube-like structure lined by the epithelial cells, which is the first line of defense, and it's held together by zona occludens and zona claudens. Uh, to form tight junctions. Um, next, there are loose connective tissue uh, called the lamina propria, which has blood vessels and lymphatic tissue, uh, lymphatic vessels and the malts, um, or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, specifically the GI tract. It's referred to as GALT or GI associated lymphoid tissue. And then the submucosa is a dense connective tissue layer followed by smooth muscle layer. Uh, this I actually just pulled down off the internet and it's a uh, cross-sectional view of the GI tract and what it looks like, of course, starting uh, with the epithelial um, lining, which is not labeled here, but then the mucosa and um, I believe this is a muscularis mucosa, uh, the submucosa, uh, and then more muscular tissue. There's a chat thing on there. I don't know if that's from earlier or if Sarah has a question. Oh, you can hear it. Great. Okay. Okay. So malt, like I mentioned, is mucosal-associated lymphoid tissue. It's unencapsulated like lymph nodes are, but it's organized in a similar fashion. Uh, the total surface area in the GI tract is 200 square meters, um, consisting of uh, 10 to the 14th cells that are in the gut. Um, and these are human cells. There's at least that in bacteria cells as well. Oh, maybe that does include bacteria cells. It represents at least 500 different species and degrades components of our diets and regulates the immune system. So in the GI tract, the innate immune system is made up of mucosal secreting goblet cells, um, M cells, which are important in antigen sampling, PANA cells, which are important for secreting antibiotics, and then, of course, the epithelial cells, which are that first line of defense, which have tight junctions, uh, which keep out um, antigens that we don't want um, to be absorbed. Okay, so the goblet cells, the main um, job is to secrete mu uh, mucin, so they can either be secreted or membrane bound. So the secreted mucin forms hydrated gel that prevents microbial contact with the epithelium, and then there's membrane um, bound a mucins that form a glycocalyx, uh, both uh, part of the innate immune system and both preventing microbial contact with the GI tract. The secreted mucins are uh, MUF2, 5, and 6, and membrane bound are 1, 3, 12, 13, and 17. Probably don't need to differentiate those two, if I had to guess. Okay. So the PAN cells uh, secrete antibiotics that we produce, such as defensins, in particular alpha defensins. 
uh, HD5, HD6, a defect in defenses is one cause of Crohn's disease. So probably is something that is important to know. Uh, so this is how the immune system in the GI tract is organized. So uh, you have your lymph drainage, which can go to mesenteric lymph nodes, which are encapsulated and very and are what we have spoken of many times before. But then, of course, we have other follicles formed in payers patches um, that are accessed from the gut through end cells, which of course we've talked about before. And then we have all our major players of cells. Um, mining the gut ready to determine if things um, are pathogenic or if they are harmless and what the immune reaction should be. Okay, so this is actually a bit long. Um, it has no sound, so it's dry. Mm -hmm. But this just came out of nature and I like it a lot. So we're going to watch it. I guess we're getting a massage. That's yeah, that or a massage. That's more me. That's that typical diet. Yeah, I know. The human gut can be the scene of a devastating condition such as inflammatory bowel disease, which arises through an improperly controlled immune response. The gut is often the body's first point of contact with microbes. Every mouthful of food is accompanied by a cargo of microorganisms that go on to encounter the mucosa, the innermost layer of the gut. Most of this is destroyed by the harsh, acidic environment in the stomach, but a hardy few make it through to the intestine. The intestinal surface is covered with finger-like protrusions called villi, whose primary function is the absorption of nutrients. However, these structures and the underlying tissue also host the body's largest population of immune cells. Scattered along the intestinal mucosa are dome-like structures called payer patches. These are enriched in lymphoid tissue, making them key sites for coordinating immune responses to pathogens while promoting tolerance to harmless microbes and food. The villi contain a network of blood vessels to transport nutrients from food to the rest of the body. Lymphatics from both the payer's patches and villi drain into the mesenteric lymph node. Within the villi is a network of loose connective tissue called the lamina propria, and at the base of the villi are the crypts, which host stem cells that replenish the epithelium. Finally, the epithelium, together with its thick overlying mucus, forms an important barrier against microbial invasion. Embedded within the matrix of the payer's patch is a mix of immune cells including T and B lymphocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. A key function of the payer's patch is the sampling of antigens, in this case, mostly bacteria and bits of food. To facilitate this, the payer's patch has a much thinner mucus layer as well as specialized phagocytic cells called M cells, which can transport material across the epithelial barrier via a process called transcytosis. Finally, dendritic cells are able to extend dendrites between epithelial cells to sample antigens that are then broken down and used for presenting to lymphocytes. Sampling antigens in this way typically results in so-called tolerogenic activation, where the immune system initiates an anti-inflammatory response. <laughs> With their cargo of antigens, these dendritic cells then traffic to the T cell zones of the payer patch. Upon encounter with specific T cells, the dendritic cells convert them into an immunomodulatory cell called a regulatory T cell or Treg. Defects in the function of these cells are associated with inflammatory bowel disease in both animals and humans. These Tregs then migrate to the lamina propria of the villi via the lymphatic. Here, the Treg secretes a molecule called IL-10 which is the, the suppressive action on immune cells within the lamina propria and upon the epithelial layer itself. 
IL-10 is therefore critical in maintaining immune quiescence and preventing unnecessary inflammation. However, a breakdown in this process of immune homeostasis results in gut pathology, and when this occurs over a prolonged period and in an uncontrolled manner, it can be up to inflammatory bowel disease. Chemical, mechanical, or pathogen-triggered barrier disruption, coupled with particular genetic susceptibilities, may all combine to set off inflammation. Epithelium coming into contact with bacteria is activated, leading to bacterial influx. Alarm molecules released by the epithelium activate immune cells, and t rex in the vicinity scale down their IL-10 secretion to enable an immune response to proceed. Dendritic cells are also activated by this environment and start to release key inflammatory molecules such as IL-6, IL-12, and IL-23. Effective T cells also appear on the scene, and these coordinate an escalation of the immune response by secreting their own inflammatory molecules, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-17. Soon after the effective T cells have arrived, a voracious phagocyte called a neutrophil is recruited. Neutrophils are critical for the clearance of bacteria. One weapon in the neutrophil armory is the ability to undergo a dramatic form of self-destruction called mitosis. This leaves behind a jumble of DNA saturated with enzymes called a neutrophil extracellular trap. Although this can effectively destroy bacterial invaders and plug any breaches in the epithelial wall, it also causes collateral damage to tissues. Slowly the tide begins to turn and the bacterial invasion is repulsed. Any remaining neutrophils die off via apoptosis, a non-inflammatory form of cell death, and are cleared by macrophages. Epithelial integrity is restored by replacement of any damaged cells with new ones from the intestinal crypt. Finally, t rays are recruited once again to calm the immune response. Targeting the molecules involved in gut pathology is leading to effective therapies for inflammatory bowel disease. receptors in the GI tract to recognize all these microbes and to classify them. So TLRs, we know that TLR 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 9 are all found in the GI tract. So now's an excellent time for a quiz. <laughs> what do each of these TLRs bind? Oh. Yes. <laughs> TLR 2. TLR 2 is lipo peptides and tetoglycan. Exactly. So tetoglycan and lipopeptides in what other TLR does it um, associate with Dimer. 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 Like TLR6. Uh, 6 also does, like, lipopeptide. Or... Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Same, Same thing. They're, they're found Lipo together to Dimer. Okay. Yep. Uh, TLR4. LPS. 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 Very good. Um, what does TLR4 form a dimer with? CD14. Yeah, it's actually not another TLR, CD14. Um, TLR5, flagellin, flagellin, TLR6, we talked about. Uh, so which are the intracellular TLRs? Three, seven, eight, nine. Great. So if they're intracellular, then they're probably going to recognize breakdown products of cells, which would be yeah. RNA, yeah. RNA. So what's TLR7? Three, seven, and eight are single-strand RNA. Great. And nine, nine is double-strand. I mean, it's CPG. Yeah, unmethylated yeah. CPG. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Very good. Uh, okay, so TLRs, ligation of the TLRs can actually increase the strength of the tight junction, which we think is something that is favorable. It increases intestinal mobility and uh, increases epithelial proliferation. It does all this without inducing inflammation. Okay, so this is actually just a picture from the Abbas text. And it shows um, the different types of pattern recognition receptors that are in um, the GI tract in their different locations. So they can actually be within the intestinal epithelial cells, as in the um, 
case of NLRs and uh, what NLR defect can lead to Crohn's disease. Not not too. Not too. Very good. Okay. Um, so that's all part of the innate immune response in the GI tract, the adaptive immune response. Of course, one of the key players is IgA. Part of it is secreted, but IgM is located there as well as is IgG. And then we're just finding out a whole lot more about T17 and T regs. Okay, so N cells are actually a component of the GI tract that um, are responsible for the transcellular transport of substances from the lumen across the epithelium um, to the underlying immune system. Incidentally, Salmonella uses N cells as a route of invasion. Probably a fact to remember. Um, so this is actually just a picture of an N cell and um, the pathogens that would be uh, transported across into the payer's patch. So another way that um, the, the, the environment of lumen is sampled is through dendritic cells. Uh, so they are actually sampled in um, the video showed this is a large arm that kind of went up into the lumen and sampled and brought it back down. So the dendritic cells that sample the antigens in the lumen are CD11B positive. CD11, of course, is the base of CD18 um, and is an integrin. So the, the dendritic cells that present to T regs or to the T cells are CD103 positive. So this is actually something that's um, newer but may pop up because it's um, and increasingly understood that CD103 positive dendritic cells are necessary to cause that switch to Tregs. And this is not just in the environment of the GI tract. This would be anywhere. So if you can somehow get in your mind to associate Tregs and CD103 positive, that's probably to the extent of what you need to know. But it is probably a necessary element in the um, population of Tregs. And this is just a picture from Boss showing that so this is the CD11B uh, positive dendritic cell. It actually has an extension that comes up through the between the epithelial cells. It uh, samples antigen. It downregulates CD11B and upregulates CD103 when it presents to T cells, um, helping them to become the FOXP3 positive cells. OK. So homing in the gut. Um, is unique in that it has this interaction between alpha-4, beta-7, and MADCAM1. It also has CCR9, uh, CCL25 interaction. And the combination of those two things is actually uh, gut restricted. So that's the only place that things are going to home if both of those things are in play. Uh, induction of this is dependent on retinoic acid secretion by dendritic cells. So retinoic acid, of course, is made from vitamin A. So vitamin A is one of the fat-soluble vitamins and is absorbed through the gut. And then um, within lymph nodes, it is in the dendritic cell, it is exposed to um, it's called like retinaldehyde dehydrogenase, or retin something dehydrogenase. And it actually changed, what is it? It's, it's just retinal dehydrogenase. Retinal dehydro dehydrogenase. So actually change the vitamin A into its active form, retinoic acid, where it can influence the T and B cells to upregulate um, alpha-4, beta-7, and CCR9 when um, a gut-restricted um, cell. OK, so IgA, of course, is the predominant antibody in the GI um, tract. TGF-beta induces IgA isotype switching, and retinoic acid can also promote some IgE secretion. Uh, this is a stain for IgA in green and IgG in um, red. So IgG is present, but of course IgA is uh, one of the most, the most important antibodies secreted in the gut. Uh, so IgA is produced by plasma cells in the lamina propria. It is produced as a dimer, covalently held together by a J chain, like we talked about last week. And then it's transported by the poly-Ig receptor. The 
complex of endocytosis the epithelial cells transported to the uh, luminal surface, and then the poly-IG receptor is cleaved, and just the IgA and the secretory component is secreted into the gut. All that is, uh, of course, review from last week. This is the same graphic that we had up. So the uh, IgA, of course, is always in a dimer. It's held together by a Jane chain. It's a, a bound to a poly-IG receptor, and it is endocytosed, moves across the epithelial cell where it is cleaved, and then the secretary, but the secretary component um, is uh, secreted into the lumen with the IgA dimer. IgG is transported via the neonatal FC receptor, and this is actually bidirectional. This is not even directional, but of course this is a minor player compared to the IgA. Uh, so here's a, a graphic of the entire system in which an antigen is moves uh, from an end cell into the underlying payer's patch, at which time it can be uh, endocytosed uh, by different antigen presenting cells, uh, like dendritic cells, where it will present to a T cell and activate a T cell. It can be endocytosed by a B cell, and it can um, direct the T cell what to do. Um, this will help the B cell class switch into secreting IgA, becomes a plasma cell, and it will sit in the lab appropriate and secrete IgA. Um, so in the gut, T cells in the gut are uh, predominantly CD8 positive. About 10% are these gamma delta T cells that have limited diversity um, in uh, limited diversity compared to the alpha, beta uh, T cells that we typically talk about. So T17 is dependent on colonization of certain bacteria, and TH2 cells are um, responsible for mucus secretion and smooth muscle contraction. Of course, we now understand that when TH17 cells um, become out of whack, it promotes autoimmunity. There's actually uh, just a paper in uh, Nature in the past, say, two weeks that showed um, sodium chloride can actually upregulate TH17 cells, uh, pointing a finger at salt in uh, diets as a pro-inflammatory component of our diet. And then, of course, Treg cells that we um, touched on a bit are promoted by the CD103 positive dendritic cells, CD103 Treg. Okay, just a quick word about the respiratory immune system also has tight junctions and secretes sensins, cathelicines, which are the natural antibiotics in our body, um, has plenty of mucus, which is used by cilia to expel, to bind and expel pathogens. And then, of course, surfactant protein A and surfactant protein B, which will bind to those um, pathogen-associated molecular patterns and suppress immune responses, inhibiting both TLR2 and TLR4 signaling. Uh, just like the GI tract, you get CD103 positive dendritic cells that sample the airway to control the immune system and prevent persistent inflammation in an environment that is readily exposed to lots of different pathogens. The cutaneous immune system, of course, um, is made up of the outer epidermis. Um, with epithelial cells and keratinocytes, and then the underlying dermis, which is connective tissue. It totals about two square uh, meters on our body. Uh, so this is just a picture of the outer layers of the skin, of course, the epidermis, and then um, the highly innervated dermis with the um, underlying subcutaneous fat. Of course, whenever we talk about um, the difference between angioedema and urticaria. Urticaria is when mast cells um, explode closer up in the epidermis, which are held together by tight junctions so it can't spread as fast. It doesn't itch because there's fewer pain receptors here. As you go down farther, there are more nerves um, in pain receptor. Uh, I take that back opposite. You get itch uh, with uh, urticaria because that's where the um, 
nerve endings are. When you're underneath in the dermis, there are no nerve fibers, so um, and there's no uh, tight junctions. So if mast cells um, break open there and promote swelling, the swelling can actually track pretty far. It's not an isolated wheel, um, and it doesn't tend to itch because there are no pain receptors there for it to ligate. So uh, the skin can also secrete natural antibiotics, just like the respiratory tract and the GI tract. There's still the sensins and cephalosidins. There's also one called S100 that seems to be important. So SAF epidermidis um, is actually an important um, um, microbe on the skin that is really pathogenic and actually helps upregulate these uh, defensins and cephalosidins, and therefore it the staph epi can actually help the body to fight um, pathogenic staph infections. Um, and to me, making it a tougher argument um, to antimicrobial your entire body. So the antimicrobials that are now very popular in soap um, will likely also affect your staph, staph epidermis. And of course, this is just me hypothesizing. Um, but uh, I do wonder if it actually will predisposition you to pathogenic skin infections if you are then down-regulating your defenses of cephalosis. And the bleach baths, too, could kill off those. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, if a kid has, um, if they're getting persistent MRSA infections or any staph infections, especially because they have um, atopic derm, they need extra antibiotic, but um, if kids are not getting infected, I actually stay away from antimicrobials and um, in atopic derm. What's this? I, I don't remember this, the, the structure, the molecular structure of the defensins, but I, I think they're low on disulfide bonds, no. and that's what the chlorine hits hardest is mm -hmm. disulfide bonds, so it may not destroy those quite as strongly as it would work on the bacteria, but yeah, uh, it's just theory. Yeah, yeah um, yes, but if the staph epi is what's helping upregulate yeah. the defense of the cathocenes in the first place, it's not going to get there, there down. But we don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. But we were joking about taking a, a yogurt bath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just rub yogurt on your skin. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> So uh, Langerhans dendritic cells, of course, are um, the dendritic cells that have Burbeck granules. Um, and the Burbeck granules being the tennis racket shaped things, and these are actually traditional dendritic cells that, um, when we talk about our immune cycle, um, that present in the T lymphocytes are really kind of the, the, the strongest antigen presenter of the dendritic cells. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to cover this much, but this is a graphic um, from a boss that uh, really sh uh, shows the environment uh, in the skin, but this is really where the whole immune system starts off with it, and Drix cell is going to um, ingest that microorganism, go into the lymph, and get to the lymph node to start uh, the whole immune circuit. Uh, the last thing that I thought was interesting in this chapter, and should be said, uh, it talks about the role of um, sunlight exposure and actually uh, lymphocyte tracking to the skin. So um, in the gut, it's the fat soluble vitamin, vitamin A, which can then be broken down to retinoic acid, which promotes uh, homing to the gut. In the skin, it's vitamin D. So vitamin D can actually get broken down um, and upregulate uh, CCR10, CCR4, and CLA, which is going to track lymphocytes back to the skin. So vitamin D is important in, in not just ingestion, but it is important to get some light to be able to um, get some of these lymphocytes to track back to the skin and to do the job in the skin. And that's it that I have for today. Any questions about all that? Not a whole lot of new things that you can do. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, 
go to acaai.org. See you next time.